think let's start, Ron, let's start with, can you give our, our readers basically a brief introduction to you, your background and bring us to the present? Yeah. Um, yeah thank you very much. I, pre I appreciate that, uh, Mary. And so my background in history, I, uh, I'm a native Californian, third generation here. Um, started in farming, or my family started in farming and agribusiness, and I went off to school um, and, and was going to uh, going to be in agribusiness, and, and that's the exact degree I have. But I stopped at a at a uh, at a job fair one day. There was a there was a bank there at that time, or well, multiple banks there, looking for uh, you know new employees. And I remember looking at my roommate, both of us dead broke. And, and saying, you know what, I'm never going to be a banker. I'm never going to be in finance, but wow, they're going to pay us. They're going to teach us and we get nine months free. This is a way to go. Well, you know, 20 years later, I'm in banking and been in finance all my life. What have I done? Um, from that, from that one, that one moment in time, um, I, I pretty much worked at small community banks and that's where I got my start working with, you know, customers every day in every small community bank, um, predominantly across, across in California, Oregon and Washington was my sort of roots or my, my beginnings. Um, and those banks are really the fabric of America. Community banks really are the fabric. And then from there, I started to move and joined Union Bank, Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi, Rabo Bank, your real large money center, multinational banks. And that's where I learned a lot about where finance was and where it was going. And, and I really was at that point indoctrinated into the financial world. And then fast forward a little, a little bit to just in the last decade, um, I, I've either worked for banks that are challenged challenged meaning from a, a regulatory or finance perspective are banks that are not necessarily having challenges um, from a, a problem asset perspective, but they're having challenges to grow their bank, to build it, to, to expand, to reach that potential that they felt they have. Um, and so the last couple of, of banks I worked for, or uh, one was in, was in FinTech, was actually financing FinTech, um, and I shouldn't say FinTech, technology companies in general. That's where I learned a lot about it and how banking and, fin and technology was going to come together. My most recent job was, um, I was CEO for Revolut in the Americas, um, and built out their program and their introduction to the country here. And, uh, just recently, um, I've had the opportunity to, to be CEO of Moonstone Bank, which is a fully specialized, fully licensed, chartered bank in America um, that is specializing in all things being digital, but mainly strategic and specific industries that have difficulty getting into the banking rails, for example, cannabis, or for example, um, cryptocurrency, those types of things. Um, and that's, that's what we do today, and that's where I am today. Excellent. Thank you for that. Well, before we, we go into all the specifics of what's happening now, um, fintechs, digital banking, new customers' behaviors, and where it's going, can you please, and this is what our CEOs and our audience love, they love reminders of which have been the biggest disruptors in the banking industry and how did it transform? Let's talk about 25, 30 years you know, ago till now. What have been the biggest disruptors uh, and let's take it from there. And how has it transformed? Um, there's been three or four major um, movements in the banking world. And I, I know that others will say, oh, there's been hundreds. But there's really been three or four kind of um, trends that you will see. And to me, trends are fact. You know, they're, they're not what we think they're going to have. If you look at the banking, legacy banking business in the, in the 30s, when it really got, you know, started to get stability and FDIC and the, Federal Reserve and the OCC and all of those organizations, there was 14,000 banks in America. I'm not talking branches, I'm talking banks. So between 1934 and 50 years later, about 84, there was still 14,000 banks. There were still 14,000 banks at that. Now, they may have been different banks, but that's the way. So that was like the golden age of banking. Everybody had banks. So what took place? What took place was all of a sudden, then you could start to do multi-state banking. You could start to do some other things that started to take place. So you kind of fast forward, you know, for, for 25 years and it gets you into 2009 and the branches of the banks didn't really grow. The number of banks didn't grow, but the branches doubled. So you, you went from like 40,000 branches in America to 80,000. So it's a moment in time when Banks, pretty much one, one branch banking. That's what Glass Steagall said you're going to have. Bank plain and simple. So now you can branch bank and now you all of a sudden accelerate branches, but you, 
you slowed the growth of actual banks. Big, big moment in banking. And then what happened, you know, let's fast forward to 2019, you know, just a, just a few years ago. The actual number of banks went from that 14,000 number I told you roughly that are FDIC insured mm-hmm. are down to 4,500 banks. So in massive 25 years, massive, because yeah. another, another moment in time. Now you've got all these branches that are out there that are servicing. You don't need a new bank in every community, but you can all also, from a perspective of, of e- electronics, you can now start to interlink all those branches and you've got multiple bank accounts in multiple states. And so now you don't need all these additional banks being built. You've got all these branches. And then the third great moment that took place was just in the recent last couple of years was where Actual, the number of branches, as you, you probably already know, Marco, have been shrinking as well. So now it's not just the number of actual banks, but now the branch numbers are shrinking because the moment that took place was all those promises, all those promises that fintechs and technology and maybe in general made a 10 or 15 years ago can now actually be delivered. You know, it used to be a decade ago, we're going to make everything technology, it's going to be online. All we really did was we scanned our, our documents, our forms that you had to fill out and put them online. And, and that was it. You know, oh, they're online. You know, but nothing really happened. Now, you can do it online. You don't, it's not a form. You're basically instant approvals. You can, you can cross-pollinate across different banks with, with open banking, all in one collaboration in one place. That's first. Second of all, that the regulators, even reluctantly, but they are accepting the fact that this is a way that finance is going to be delivered to the consumer and they are, are they're moving forward. They've came to the conclusion that technology companies and mainly fintechs that we're talking about here today used to be too small to care about. Now they're too big to ignore. So the regulators are coming along into that fold. And then the third thing is it's a generational thing. It's generational. In which sense? It's generational, I mean, the customers. The customer has reached a point from a generational pr- perspective, you know, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen D, whatever, whatever you want to use. Mm-hmm. They're used to that, you know, that phone that's in their hand, and they're accepting of a digital way. They don't need to toddle down to the branch anymore and wait for it to open up and go sit with somebody. Their expectations are fully acceptable <clears throat> to use their own deal. So that's, a, that's what's generational. You're not going to get you know, a lot of, you know, baby boomers, let's say, to all of a sudden say, gee, I'm going digital and I don't care about my branch. That's what I mean by, by generational from the customer. The customer is now that third leg, the third rail that's saying, I expect digital. I don't need a branch. I don't want to wait on a branch. I want to be able to freeze. I want to be able to change my pen. I want to freeze my card if I lost it. I want to unfreeze my card. I want to. I want a, a virtual card because I'm going to go use a third party to buy something online, and I'm not really sure about them. So I'm going to use a virtual card, make that purchase, and cancel my card so that nobody can steal it from me. That's what the generation. So the regulators. I said the regulators, the customer, and the technology there can actually deliver on what they said they could do a decade ago. So that kind of fast forward is the put us there. And so that trend we're on today, um, that's that's just accelerating going forward. Uh, two questions here, because I've read um, arguments in different articles, for example, and I can't remember this and I wish I could, and I'm going to send you that article after our meeting. Great. Where this bank, a big bank, I think it was J.P. Morgan Chase, started opening brick and mortar uh, 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 branches, and I said, wait, 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 I thought we were only going forward with eliminating brick and mortar. So I want to ask you, the pendulum, you know, sometimes when we, you know, when we had only radio and then TV, you know, was introduced, we thought we were going to be done with radio. And look at today, we have thousands of stations worldwide, right? <laughs> um, what is the pendulum of that brick and mortar digital aspect worldwide? Where, where is it going? Are we are we done with brick and mortar? Are we going to be done with brick and mortar? Or are we going to find that the pendulum says, wait, we had this, all of a sudden we all went digital, but now we sometimes miss this part of the brick and mortar. Um, do you think there's going to be a midpoint there or not? What's, what, what you see happening, and that's a good point, you talk about some, some banks are talking about expanding a branch network. 
Okay. But mm-hmm. yeah, you have to peel that back a little bit and see what they're really doing. Okay. So, mm-hmm. well, let me back up first and say, look at Europe and not that Europe is the Holy Grail when it comes to finance. I'm not saying that. Um, but they did embrace digital before the Americas did, or at least not, not South America or Central America, as you point out, but, but right. North America, they did embrace it sooner. They have a lot fewer banks, a lot fewer branches than, than the United States has today. Okay, so that's one example of, of countries that embrace digital before the U.S. did in the results. Now, to peel your onion back about branches, walk into a branch when, some, when, when a bank today says, we've opened a new branch. And I'm not talking about a community bank in a small rural setting, um, but I'm talking about in a more urban perspective is that that's not the branch that you used to. You walk in and there's a great big teller line and there's a merchant ser- service line and there's 15 people on the platform and there's, you know, milk and cookies at the front desk. Mm-hmm. You know, what it is today, it's, it is an expert center that's almost like a help center that where you have a big challenge. You know, you, you, you cannot, you need to sit down with somebody across the table or you need to go to a, a virtual counter, um, and, and see one there. And there you get the expert help. You know, you're, you can't for some reason get your merchant account to work. You have challenges from a FX or foreign currency problem that you're trying to, to get, work your way through. Then those branches are going to be more expert driven versus transaction driven. Branches have always been transaction driven. Line up on Friday, get your check cashed, you know, go through that, you know, put some money in savings and, you know, take some money out for Friday night. But that's not what the branches are now. You're lucky if you can do a transaction in a a new modern branch today. They're about high level expertise there. Right. And and so I guess I would say that they're not only like a help desk, but they're also there to upsell you as well. So it's become kind of like an expert kind of like, well, these are all the solutions that we can give you so that you can continue being our customer and we can give you more solutions to this specific thing that is much more complex than just sending money or receive or opening an account, right? So that's, that's, that's a, a good point. Account. Expert yeah. centers. Right. Yeah, they're, they're, that's a good point. They're probably going to be, you know, um, and hopefully in a, in a judicious way of upselling someone to say, this is a better product or this will resolve your issue for you. And it's not something that you can tap online and, and basically get because online is a, even for the mass affluent, that word mass, anything that's mass is going to be online, digital, you know, PDA held in your hand. Um, and, and you're going to be able to do all the services you need, you need to do that. And then even from there online, you're, you're going to be able to, to move into, you know, stocks and stocks and bonds, which you can do already. You can, you, you can buy and sell, buy, sell and hold crypto. You know, there's various things you, but you can already do online, but there's another level at times that those branches are going to fill up, you know, a void for that you just are not going to be able to get done online or you don't feel comfortable getting done. Right. You mentioned generations. This is very important because we, we did another interview, I think a week ago and one of the banks, digital bank, fintech said guess what guys uh you would be surprised but during the pandemic and i want to introduce this what happened during the pandemic all the consumer behaviors that changed uh and and the ceo of this company said guess what we had many baby boomers signing up to digital banking because many of them realized that they're 78 80 years old that they can't drive maybe sometimes to to the branches that they they want to embrace this new digital uh economy and 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 not go to the branches anymore which is, is something that we thought would never happen my grandpa always every single day wanted to walk to the bank he wanted to meet people there and he was so proud you know, with me walking hand by hand and, and telling everyone that I was his grandson, right? And he felt like he was Mr. Cabello, right? Like Don Cabello, and wow. And those days are gone, but we've seen uh, baby boomers uh, getting onto the digital era uh, and, and with banks. Uh, is that something uh, that you've seen, for example, in, in affluent uh, uh, baby boomers or just men? Mid income baby boomers or lower income baby boomers? Is that a different? I, I will break that into a couple of categories and then tell you what, what my own personal observation looking at my customers or what's right. going on is that um, 
there's, you know, you've, you've got the group that are, you know, f- fresh out of, and forget generational now, just fresh out of college. They're just, you know, moving forward, you know, and pretty soon they've got, you know, they may be married or have a partner and they have two incomes and they're trying to, you know, work their way up to gather some assets more longer term basis. And then you move into the baby boom- boomers, which have, you know, more at the end of their career, retirement, they've probably built up some pretty, you know, reasonable long-term assets. Um, so it's like a barbell. You've got, um, on one end, you've got the, the generation that's just born into the technology side and expect nothing else, and the rest is just noise to them. And then you've got this sort of flat section that has never changed. And then you've got that are the later stage baby boomers are even older, that whether it was I can't go to the branch anymore or for a physical or health reason or the branch is closed or it's not convenient hours, um, they're, they're adopting technology, one, being forced to it, but second of all, well, how they're being adopted. I, I, I've talked to hundreds of customers. And when I say, when I see a customer, a new customer, I'll call them up and say, you know, how's it, you know, welcome, welcome to the bank. Appreciate your business. Um, and most times I'll say, oh yeah, my grandson showed me how to get online. Yeah. He showed me how to do this banking thing. Um, you know, and so they do it, but they're not, they're not loyal customers. I mean, they're, they're not to the point where, oh, wow, this technology is, you know, fantastic. I just love it. I wish it was here. I don't rarely, I rarely hear that conversation. It's more like I have to do it. I'm going to do it kind of thing. But here is what banks are becoming aware of, or at least some banks are aware of. We are going to see the biggest movement of wealth in American history in the next decade. And it's going to be those baby boomers that are, you know, basically passing on, you know, mm-hmm. to their children or grandkids their wealth. And that's what's going to really drive the technology from the, the mass affluent. Because all of a sudden you're going to have a 35 year old, 40, whatever the age is, 45 year old that suddenly now has stocks and bonds and he's got a house and he's got all these things or she has all these things and they're not, they, they're going to always have been a retail click in my PDA. And that's going to require this bridge that's going to have to take place. That's where the mass affluent needs to be addressed is because they don't need it today and they're fully digital savvy, but they're going to be set with a, a new challenge, a good challenge, you know, from assets, a, a good challenge. But how does that fit into kind of that retail doesn't fit into it? That's, you know, to me, what I see going on from the generational question that, that you just asked. That's okay. one of the key things. And you're right. I, I read that the average baby boomer is worth a million dollars. I mean, and the average, and, and, and like you said, all that wealth is going to go into the 35, 45-year-olds. And all of a sudden, this new generation millennials are going to be massively affluent. Correct. Right. We hear, we hear, you know, Marco, we hear all that, you know, I just, you know, I invested in X and I became a millionaire at 21 or 29 or 30. Yes, there are those stories. I live in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a tremendous level of, of million multimillionaire stock options that have, that have hit home runs. But that is really a small percent when you look at all across the globe, but mm-hmm. certainly in America as well, is that it's really that, that um, wealth transfer is where the volume's at and where the demand's going to come. There, there is, you know, the stories that we hear of people that have worked hard at a, at a young age and have, have hit a home run. Yes, but they're going to be only a small percent of all this wealth transfer that's going to take place. 